Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Vago Maradian in Everett, Washington, in the world's largest building by volume, where Boeing, commercial airplanes company, produces some of the world's most iconic commercial aircraft, including the 747, the 777, as well as the 787. And we have uh, with us uh, Jeff Haber, who's been working for the company since 1979. 1979. 1979. At the age of six, six you started. I started. I was a young. I was a young engineer, and I worked on the 757 program. So. Uh, and and that's right. They were they were they were growing them young in Cornell. Uh, in, 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 in your area, uh, and you are the uh, regional uh, director for commercial airplanes marketing. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, how this factory has changed over the decades. I mean, obviously it was built for the 747 program. Uh, first delivery of that was 1970. At that time, uh, Bill Allen did bet the future of the company on it, as he bet the future of the company on the 707, uh, which was the first uh, swept wing uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, tell us a little bit about how this factory has evolved and changed over the decades. So what, what's phenomenally interesting about the factory is that you can see, even within just within the factory, the evolution from the original manufacturing techniques of the 747 all the way through to the advanced robotic manufacturing techniques that we're going to use on 777X and 787. So for example, if you go in the 47 area, they still have frames and they take panels and they rivet the panels to the frames and it moves along to 777 where you use more robotics, more advanced manufacturing and then still at the factory though you install the systems and then you go to the 787 where the fuselage sections are barrels made by composite without any without any um, uh, rivets for the stringers and then they're manufactured in far off locations. The systems are installed there and they come here and they're already like we say we are they're already stuffed so the sections are already stuffed and you can assemble the airplane in a much shorter time with much greater efficiency and with 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 in a way that was unprecedented 10 years ago so we go all the way from frames and panels and rivets all the way through composite barrels and systems put together uh, in a much shorter more efficient way when um, you guys are doing a, a whole bunch of work also to prepare for the 777X, um, obviously it's going to be an all-composite wing. We visited the composite wing facility, um, taking a look at how these uh, enormous structures, I mean, it's the world's largest autoclave, 28 I feet know, in yeah. diameter, 120 feet long, which is really, really uh, and, you know, amazing to watch, but also some of the other processes and technologies you're using. How is that changing the commercial aircraft production game as far as you guys are concerned? Well, so what advanced manufacturing does, it does a number of things. It makes it, first of all, safer for employees, it lowers our costs, and it makes us more efficient. And in this world, in this competitive world, I mean, you know what, you know what the competition is like. We have to be able to build better airplanes in less time at lower cost. And using advanced manufacturing, using robotics, using the moving line that you can see back here, all those things together give us that ability to lower costs and maintain quality and even increase quality and safety. As you um, guys, you know, one of the things is that this is a gigantic um, shell game with gigantic airplanes that are moving around, right? The 7, 747, it, it's really, it really is amazing. I mean, if you find yourself in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's worth coming and taking a tour of this factory. Uh, a million you know, pound takeoff weight on the 747 fully loaded, yeah. almost a million pounds. And, and six million parts flying uh, in, in unison. And I should say Boeing is one of our sponsors, but that's, that's not oh, one of the reasons really? why I'm making that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see after this interview. But, uh, but tell us you know, a little bit about how the moving line actually all works, because these aircraft are sort of inching along at a, at a staggering speed of 1.6 inches uh, an hour, but that's actually remarkably fast given how much work is being done in it. Talk to us a little bit about how you're doing workflow and how workflow in here has evolved so, to make sure it's most efficient. So this is a 777, the 87 line works similar. This is actually a U-shaped moving line and so you have the parts move around at the staggering 1.6 inches per hour. You, you assemble, I'm still amazed at how it happens. You assemble the wings to the center section, and then you move it forward, and then you put the fuselage sections onto that wing, wing body join, and then as it moves down the line, you increase the amount of systems, landing gear, and it's all done, it's all done in, a, in a matter of days at, as you said, the staggering 1.6 inches per hour. Back in the the previous way that we used to do it is that we used to put the airplanes into positions and then when everything was done in that position you would have to back the airplane out of the position and move it to the next position. With the moving line, once again, efficiency, lower cost, safety, you can put the parts in as it rolls out the door. It seems really logical. Not easy to do, but it seems really logical. And uh, and as you were um, as you were saying that 
Um, the technology is changing the name of the game. There are a few of the ergo cribs there from the older generation where it allowed you to revolve the fuselage barrel so that folks can be more ergonomically comfortable, they're not riveting up or in other directions. But you're saying that those are going to go away. How do they go away and how long before they're totally a thing of the past? Is so, so what you were talking about is the turning jigs so that mechanics would not have to buck rivets, uh, you know, pointing down towards the ground. They could do it standing up. And so we've managed through automated processes and they're still evolving, we're working on having robots who get less tired, <laughs> they don't get tired at all, robots who get less tired, drill the holes and put the rivets in. Actually, a while back, for the 4.7, we've made manufacturing improvements. The, the gem core riveting machines actually use robots to drill the holes and put the stringers into the wing skins. And so we've carried that to the next level. The idea is, why make the, the mechanics do the work that's, that, that, could be, that could be done more easily and more efficiently by machines and still maintain that level of quality and safety? When it, uh, as you got, one of the things that's fascinating about the wings as, it, as they come here is they come as finished products with no fasteners in them. They're one contiguous baked pieces as they, as they arrive here, pre-drilled with 5,000 holes for everything that's, go, that's going to go on it. 777X you're talking about? 777X. 777. Um, as you look to what's the next generation of production efficiency that we're likely to see as you look at this factory, say, 10 years from now compared to where it is today, given that virtually every single one of these airplanes is being touched by production changes and tweaks that you're doing, wingtip changes, for example, on the 777s, obviously a whole bunch of changes on the yeah, on the 74. Yeah. On the yeah, we've managed to make the 777 just for some changes to the airplane 2% more efficient than, than the previous version. It's great. So what's going to happen 10 years from now? Wow, you know, that's, that's almost like asking me what my phone is going to look like 10 years from now, right? Because, because who knows? But what I can imagine I think what I could imagine is even even a cleaner situation than this, right? Things more things more in place, less less fixtures and monuments and rigs, and just more done ahead of time, so that this truly is just a place where you put the pieces together to do the final assembly. Um, you know, obviously the things that you guys are doing are driven by the market and what the customers ultimately want. Talk us a little bit through how, and because 777X is near and dear to your heart, even though you started on the 757 program. Uh, it, 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 Best exactly. landing airplane Boeing's ever built. Sorry, to say that. Um, and, and also the second fastest airplane in the sky, right? I mean, once the Concorde went away, it was the 747, and then right after that was the was the 757, uh, and and still is still is a remarkably speedy airplane. But um, what are the what are some of the biggest substantive changes between the 777 Classics and what you're doing on the X? So so think about it. So. The 777 came into service in 1995. It was revolutionary. Fly-by-wire, central maintenance systems, and we sold over 1,800 of them, 900 of these 777-300ERs. And so like, what are, we, what are we doing now to go from 777, which is a phenomenal, successful flagship airplane, to the 777X? Well, we're taking the best parts of the 777, like the electrical power system. We're going to take the most reliable, innovative parts of the 87 over there, like the Common Core system, the CCS, we're going to put that all together. Some new technologies on 777X, we're going to put it together to get the best of really three worlds, right? 777, 87, and new technologies to build an airplane that's going to be double digit more efficient than, than the competition. It's going to be assembled in, in less time with greater quality and, 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 and to, to last, to become the to become the the the, the, flag, the to continue the tradition of being a flagship, right? Triple Seven X will be the flagship going well into the 21st century. And and you made a uh, historical analogy, right? I do. From one of your historical airplanes Thank you to for the asking. other. I love historical analogies, but go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I was going to say, what is the historical analogy you use? Because uh, you know everybody who knows me knows I'm a fan of the of the 707. That's right. So, so you Jeff? said I love the 707, and I said, you know, the Triple Seven X, in a way. It's going to be a lot like the transition from the 707-120 to the 707-320, the 320 of the Intercontinental. Make the engines uh, uh, more, well, it's kind of interesting. I'm going to talk about it in a second. Newer engines, make it a little bit, make it a little bit wider, make it a little bit bigger, give it a little bit more range to carry into the future. And as you know, the 320 Intercontinental is very successful. It was funny because I, I, started, to, I started to talk about um, um, increase the engine thrust, but the 777X is going to be so efficient that it's going to accomplish everything that the 777-300ER can do with less thrust than the GE 9115B using the, the new GE 9X engines. So we've taken that analogy. Let's take a really successful flagship. Let's make it bigger, give it more range, give it more capability, put in new technologies to carry it for the next who knows how many years. It might be a little bit after I retire.
It'll be a lot after her time. <laughs> hey, you got a couple of years uh, in you. Thanks. When it, when it um, comes also to the 747, you guys were looking, you were eyeing the uh, ending. The uh, yes, it's another it's another incredible iconic airplane. And I also, as an airplane nut, have a lot of airplanes that I that I love. So there's no one airplane that's my favorite airplane. But that also is an iconic airplane. It got a new lease on life, obviously after UPS ordered those 14 jets. Uh, there's an option for another 14 yes. that could keep the line line line, line rolling. Um, how much legs does that program have? I mean, is this you're doing borrowed time? You talked about what the gross freighter market particularly is. What's the outlook for that jet? So, so the the freighter market is 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 forecast to grow at about four percent a year. So that means over the next 20 years, there'll be a need for new and replacement for around 900 freighters. Given the capability of the 47 of the 47 freighter, especially the ability to open up the nose gear door to carry really large and unusually shaped objects, we feel that that the 747, the Dash 8, can carry on. Remember, it uses it uses some 87 technology, so it's an improvement over the 47400. But it, it it is the it is the it's a it, let me think of the best way to put this. It's a great, it's a great freighter, and it's going to be a great freighter for a long time. Um, what were some of the most important lessons learned on that program? I mean, Boeing originally started that program to do, you know, like a one and a half billion dollar very quick update to the airplane, and it became something that was infinitely more expensive and and, and prolonged. What were, you know, what were some of the reasons for that, and what were some of the lessons that were learned from that that you're applying to other programs as you spruce them up? So, so, based upon, and we always do this as we evolve from one program to the next. We look at the we look at the processes. We look at the ways. There's always ways you can make things happen more efficiently and more effectively. And so sometimes, if you hit a bump in the road, well, a bump in the road isn't necessarily a bad thing because you can find out. Well, okay, we hit a bump in the road. So what can we do to what can we do to um, um, to not have that happen the next time? For example, triple seven triple seven X. The development is going really great. The weight and all the, the characteristics right on right on target. And so, taking that what we've learned from 47-8 and from 87, applying those processes and get the people to apply the processes, you can continually improve manufacturing. Is that going to present any sort of problems to you, though? Because it is still a very classically produced airplane, right? There are folks who are still driving rivets on it, whereas the next generation of airplanes you're looking at is to try to shift as much the composites as you can in the, in the transition. Is there going to be a challenge building an airplane that is really of a much earlier generation, updated, but still of a much earlier generation from a production you know, process standpoint? You know, I really, I really, I really mean this. I meant everything else, but I really mean this too. <laughs> you know, I think it comes down, I think it comes down to the people. The people, we didn't have a chance to talk to people. But the, the people on, the, on all of our programs, and the ones that have been here for a while, and the ones that are relatively new, are, are, so, are so dedicated to the company. Heck, I've been with the company, you know, for, because, 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 I just, because I just love airplanes, right? It's like you. And the people here, they love airplanes, and they, want it, and they want to build the best airplanes. And so I don't think it'll ever be a case where, if we're not using the most up-to-date techniques, that we won't have the... The, the capability, we won't have the engineering, we won't have the ingenuity, we won't have the we won't have the the the, the people the, the, the people involved all working together, catchy, all working together to, to build the best product, even if it's not the latest tech, even if it's not the latest manufacturing techniques. And let me ask you one last question. What is the big challenge? You know, what is what is something that it most causes a bottleneck as you guys are working? You know, what are the things that you're on guard for that to a layperson may not be a big thing, but it actually becomes a showstopper here when you guys are trying to you know, manage an enterprise this gigantic with so many parts arriving from so many places to make sure that these things are racing along at 1.5, 1.6 inches well, an hour. Well, well, there it goes. Oh, sorry, we almost got hit by one. So, I mean, you said it, right? You have millions and millions of parts. I think a 777 has like two million parts. 47 has like six million parts. To be able to, to be able to integrate this global supply chain, like it's critical to have a global supply chain, to integrate this global supply chain so that everything everything comes together when it's supposed to without any delays. I I don't know. I don't know how they I don't know how they do it, frankly. And I it's not, it's not my you know that's where you go, like it's not my department, right? But somebody has figured out how to get all these parts to come together at the same time. And as we go into the future with a, with a diverse global supply chain, it's it's not going to get any easier. It's going to be more difficult, especially if the flow times are less. Right? You want to build airplanes in less time. You want all the parts to be here precisely on time. And so that's the part that we really, really, really are keeping an eye on. Jeff, thanks very much and look forward to seeing you again next time we're out here. You know, anytime, come on back and we can spend the whole day walking around <laughs> touching stuff. <laughs>
it's it's the touch, the smell, the feel, and the sounds. Well, Nothing. Know, you know, we haven't had any riveting. We didn't have any riveting during the interview, which is too bad because I was going to make a riveting comment. Like, look at this place. This is like the greatest place in the world, and you can come back here anytime and walk around. Jeff, thanks again. Yep. Take care.